maintain those subtractions and so forth. Guess we can get started here. We've got a few people here now, so thank you for attending. Uh, this is the last talk which I'll be giving. I'm Marty Sparks. Uh, I was the founder of Max Analytical Technologies, and I am now the senior director of gas analysis R&D at Thermo Fisher. Uh, my two co-authors, Kelly McPartland. Kelly is the Applications Manager at Max Analytical, now part of Thermo Fisher. Um, she's been with the company since 2015, and uh, she's a graduate of Boston University. Uh, Kelly is an expert in FTIR gas analysis and associated method development and data validation. As a senior level technical liaison for Max customers, Kelly has been a key architect and manager for the Max software, which you're going to see a lot of today. Um, uh, ensuring uh, quality results and customer usability. Kelly also works closely with state and federal regulatory agencies to develop quality assurance plans and test methods for the company's new technologies. I'd also like to put a shout out to Olivia. Um, she helped me reprocess this data that you'll see today. Uh, it's definitely one of these cases where taking a second look at data was very beneficial. And so when I learned a week ago that I was giving this presentation, she did all, all the work uh, that you'll see here today. Um, Olivia is an uh, applications engineer at Max Analytical, part of Thermo Fisher. She joined the team in 2021 um, after graduating from Worcester Polytechnic Institute uh, with a degree in chemical and in environmental engineering. So I'll start there. And if anybody wants to interrupt, just go ahead. I will yeah, grab the yeah. Okay, I usually don't start with slides like this, but this is the thermo presentation style that I'm supposed to follow. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about first are some of the innovations that we've developed. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're keep trying to do is drive the technology to measure lower and lower. And then if, if you have the sensitivity to basically measure nothing, can you actually measure nothing? And what I mean by that is, um, when you get down to these very, very low levels, interferences are going to come from everywhere. And how you deal with those interferences is really the key thing. How, how do you make it such that you can actually say, okay, I'm seeing benzene or I'm seeing formaldehyde or whatever. And so we're going to actually, I, I rushed to get this thing so uh, fast put together. I said it was a gas fire turbine. It was actually a fuel <laughs> uh, fire turbine uh, for the data that we're going to show today. And we're going to talk about VTEX, formaldehyde, and other HAPs. Yeah, oil. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is our system. This is the new Max IR uh, system. It's a rugged 5U uh, FTIR system. It doesn't use any liquid nitrogen. Uh, it'll either use a DTGS detector or an MCT. And in this case, uh, the uh, uh, this was an MCT uh, system in our Starboost configuration. I use the dotted laser, so you're never replacing the laser. Um, it has a fully optimized optical train uh, to make sure that we're filling the detector. In our Starboost technology, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, this is where we really gain the signal to noise that in previous systems we just didn't have. Um, uh, in some of our configurations, we're literally measuring nano absorbance units. All right, that's never been heard of with infrared technology in the past. I mean, at best, you're talking maybe 100 micro absorbance units. Um, and I'll explain how we get there. Um, and it is now allowing us to see compounds well into the parts per trillion. The lowest measurement we've done to date is three parts per trillion CO2 in bulk nitrogen for a semiconductor application. Um, the TOM technology, which I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about today, is what really makes this work for this specific application. Again, you can have all the signal to noise in the world, but if your interferences are the noise, which is the case here, you can't make the measurement. So what the TOM allows us to do is basically take a perfect calibration spectrum in the field, as opposed to trying to take the library spectrum and applying it. I know most of you guys have used the FTIR in the field. You, you set up your method, you put your water, your methane, your CO2 in there as your interferences, then you put all the compounds you want, and it goes to the library, takes that water spectrum to try and match it. Well, if you try and match a library spectrum 
to a sample spectrum, the best you can match each point is to about 1%. So if this spectral point is 0.1 absorbance unit, which is a common type, the best you can do is 0.001. But what if I'm trying to measure 0.00001? You just can't do it because the noise coming from the residual between these two spectra is too great, as you'll see here in a second. So in a sense, I put in quotes here, it allows us to generate a perfect calibration spectra because we're going to do it just before we make the measurement. Uh, this is just showing a nice picture of our gas cell. Uh, a couple of nice things about this is uh, like most gas cells of its type now, there, once you assemble it, there is no alignment. But what I'm mentioning also, I think I mentioned it here, there's actually no alignment of the gas cell once you drop it into the system either. Some systems, we won't mention names, but I happen to dwell. <laughs> Sometimes you put the gas cell in and you have to align it. This one, you don't do any alignment. You just put it in. A um, couple other nice things, the spectrometer uses zinc selenide optics, so you don't actually even need to use a purge if you don't want. It uses a single crystal beam splitter. Some of you have probably looked inside the MKS instrument. You'll see that there are actually two crystals in there, which is a very common configuration. Well, this is an infrared technology. And so when you have two crystals sitting side by side, temperature matters because they can change shape, they can twist, they can slide with respect to one another because of how they're mounted. And you get changes in your baseline. And I'm sure all of you have seen the baseline kind of do that on your FTIR systems. With a single crystal, that none of that can happen. Um, and so it ends up giving us a very stable baseline. Uh, the system is also designed to work for 20 years. Uh, the gas cell volume is uh, under 500 milliliters. And as I was mentioning, there is no alignment uh, once you drop it in. Some of you may uh, notice this picture. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is it's much easier to show what we're doing with Starboost. Uh, this is actually an MKS detector uh, in the detector mount. Uh, we don't use any liquid nitrogen detectors, but this shows how uh, and what we're doing. Uh, and the first systems we built actually used an MKS system. So what we do is we replace this detector with a very, very sensitive detector one that can be at least an order of magnitude or more, more sensitive than the one that comes with the traditional system. When you do that, the problem you end up with is that the signal that you're generating is so big that the noise on that signal is well below the electronics noise, okay? So you got your, you got your electronics noise here, you got your detector noise here. That's not the way you wanna set up a system. You want your detector noise to be bigger than your electronics noise. Also, these detectors are so sensitive that when you put light on them, they, they go very nonlinear, which means you put a photon on it, you don't get a, a single response. You get something less than that, and I'll show you how much. So what we're going to do is we're going to optimize this doing two things. We're going to reduce the amount of light hitting the detector by saying, you know what? We're only interested in formaldehyde, VTEX. HCL. So we're going to look at a band pass of light and say, you know what, we're going to throw out the rest of it so that we can knock the signal intensity hitting the detector down and hopefully drive the detector linear. So we put one photon, we get one signal. You put two photons, you get two signals. And then hopefully we've got a, a small enough signal that we can turn the gain up so that the noise on the detector is now bigger than the electronics noise. If we do that, we have a fully optimized system. And when you do that, what you find is an FTIR is actually more sensitive than the, the most expensive cavity ring down systems that they make, even with quantum cascade lasers. And I'm using a five dollar, uh, a five dollar glow bar. All right. All right. So I don't need a laser to get me high signal to noise. I just need to optimize my system to get it. So. What did we do? And I, I, I like showing the very first slides of when we do something. And this is literally the first graph that we ever generated. And we knew we had something in the moment we generated this. So this is the, this is the single beam spectrum of a narrow band detector. So this is 1600 wave number. 
$1,000 here, and this goes out to 5,000 or whatever. And that's the single beam curve. All we did was we put a narrow band pass filter in front of the detector, like that picture over there, just slid it in front of them. The signal went up by three and a half times. We didn't do anything. There's no gain increase. That's showing you how nonlinear these detectors are. The, the signal literally went up three and a half times. We had done nothing. The other thing that you know, look, look at this baseline. You can't really even see any noise here. But all of the noise right there, if I were to blow it up, is all electronics noise. None of it is detector noise. If this were detector noise, if I turn the gain up, I get no enhancement. Because this noise, if I double this signal, the noise goes up by twice. But if I turn the gain way up, and unfortunately you can't really see it in this graphic, but now I've got a signal of like 60 volts. And now I have the detector noise above the electronics noise. You can't really see it there. But in this case, I got about a 30 fold enhancement in signal to noise. Right? That what that means in sensitivity is means that a system now that could do, say, you know, 100 ppb before is now down around two or three ppb. All right? It has a signal to noise to make that, that measure. Any questions on that? All right, now, <clears throat> this was our initial setup, and the reason we wanted to do that was we actually designed this originally to measure formaldehyde as low as we could. Well, what we found was people are interested in formaldehyde. They happen to be a lot more interested right now, but people wanted to do other things. They wanted to do NOx, SOx, CO, CO2, water, HCl, hydrocarbons. So what we did, was we said, okay, what we're going to do, and since I have the graphic up here, is we're going to get a detector that cuts off about here. And as it turns out, the narrower you cut this off, the more sensitive the detector is. So it's going to cut off about here. And what we're going to do is put a long pass filter in that starts here and goes over to there. So the spectrum now is going to be from about here to there. Now we're going to lose a little bit in signal to noise because we're using a longer band pass. But now we can look for everything that you would do in a normal combustion system. Uh, just, I, I thought this was kind of an interesting graphic. I don't know how easy it is to see, but this is what the filter looks like in the system. This is the actual spectrometer. This is the IR source. Again, $5 low bar compared to a, a, a very expensive laser. Here's the gas cell. The idea that the light goes in here, comes out over here, goes up through the filter and then into the gas cell. This is actually 48 bounces in here for a 10 meter path and onto the detector. This detector can be switched between DTGS and MCT. Uh, it literally just pop it up and snap it in. There's no alignment for anything. There's, all of this is pin mounted. This is pin mounted. That's pin mounted. And these two turning or these two mirrors here are fixed. You don't you don't ever adjust them. There, there's no there's no adjustment on this system whatsoever. Okay, yeah, so inside here is that single crystal. One of the reasons, and again, I, I don't want to besmirch, say, the FKS instruments since I designed it, but it does have a, a flaw. It really does. The problem is, is the, when you take a crystal and you mount that crystal, you only have two ways of mounting it. You either mount it end on with a little bit of glue, or you mount it face on. Right, with a little glue. Well, unfortunately, in their system, one of the crystals is actually a face mount. So if it takes a very, very serious vertical shock, it can come loose. As soon as that comes loose, your signal to noise goes to hell, especially at the high frequency. Any of you guys ever seen where you don't get any signal at the high frequency, but you get fine signal at, say, a thousand wave numbers? That's probably because either the crystal has come loose or there's a, there's a turning mirror in there and that mirror is on three very tight springs. And what happens is it just slightly shifts. And then again, you lose, you lose that signal. Here, that's not a problem because we just have this single crystal. So from a shock standpoint, this can handle a lot of shock. The, the one thing that the MKS has that's really good is it can handle a lot of vibration. Vibration doesn't affect it because we're scanning at a very high speed. 
This system is a more slow scanning speed. So you don't want to have, you don't want to sit this on a generator and expect it to run properly. You, you want to have at least some dampening. All right, so with the long pass system, we can look for all these things simultaneously. Unlike the first systems where we're really only looking for formaldehyde. We're going to give up a little bit in signal to noise, but as you're going to see, we're not giving up much. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about signal, are you talking about the pulse and the yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to measure all of these things. Uh, of course, CO2 and water are going to be very high. I'm trying to measure all these things that say one PPB simultaneously. Okay. okay. The way we're going to do that, so you can trust me and just believe for a second that the instrument actually has the signal to noise to measure something at a PPB. And just to give you an idea of what the noise level is, because uh, I really don't show that. I showed it in a couple of slides, but say the MKS, it's a good one because I know a number of you guys have it. If you ever look at your residual spectra, you see that the residual is about one milliabsorbance, 0 0.001. And then, you, you know, you have a good measurement. This is going to generate 0 0.00001, five zeros and a one. And that's what the residual is going to be. So you're going to be a thousand times lower in many cases. All right, for your signal to noise. Okay, so if we have the signal to noise, now what we got to do is deal with the interference. And in this particular application, the interference to worry about is water. It's a little bit of methane, but it's mostly water because everything's absorbing where the water is. So what we're going to do, we're going to use a thing called a TOM. And a TOM is, in a sense, a catalytic oxidizer. And in fact, <laughs> What's interesting is the little catalyst core that's in here came out of the oil and gas industry. It's the same core that's used on the compressor engines to reduce their emissions. And that was actually what, how this whole thing came about. I happened to have it in my office one day, and I said, I bet if I ran formaldehyde through that, I could get rid of it. Guess what? It works. So all I had to do is heat this up a little bit. I'll send a sample in here and it'll reduce the formaldehyde completely, 100%. And I actually put two in here just to make sure I get rid of it all. All right. By doing that, now I have a spectrum. And again, if I just use formaldehyde as an example, I have a spectrum with formaldehyde potentially and one without. But I have the one without the formaldehyde is everything else. So it's a perfect spectrum collected on that instrument at that time. So we generate what we call an interference spectra in the field. Our software is designed to automatically collect it and add it to the analysis algorithm. So if you want to think about it, it's adding a new water calibration right to the algorithm and saying, don't use the other one, use this one. And the data that we analyzed and why we had to relook at it was we thought we needed to keep the water calibration in. And as it turned out, as soon as we took the water calibration out, the official one, the data got much better. Right. So this is going to remove the bias from. OK, that's an excellent question. What we're going to do is keep the temperature below about for for something like oxygenates like formaldehyde. We only have to run this at about 125. It'll remove them all. So acetaldehyde, acrylin, acetaldehyde, they're all removed at very low levels. Ethylene oxide, which we do a lot of work on, heck, you could set this at 50 C and it'll remove it. But to get the BTEX compounds, we've got to go up to about 200 C. Well, the nice thing about methane, it's light off curve for a catalytic oxidizer, even to remove any of it, it's about 700 C. All right, you're not going to remove any, C, any methane until you get to about 700. So the water and the methane are going to be constant. They're not going to change at all. So then in bypass mode, this is in a sense our sample mode. We're going to close this valve, open this up, and it's just going to go in and right back out. It's, it's just we, we want to automate it so it can do it whenever it needs it. So it'll send the unmodified sample to the FTIR, and we can switch back to the oxidizer whenever we want. So the lower we want to go, more often, we might have to go to the oxidizer and say, hey, collect a new spectrum. The nice thing is the software can do it whenever you want. Okay. 
So all the data I'm going to show are going to be one wave number. I know a lot of you guys work at half wave number. So it's a little bit lower resolution. We're going to use a little bit different coast uh, appetization. But in this particular case, we're going to do this as a standard method. I know some of you have heard of auto ref that we've done in the past, where we take this, we take the interferogram, we process it a high resolution and a low resolution. The low resolution becomes the background. The high resolution is the sample. So everything looks like a derivative. We're not going to do that here because VTEX, we can't do that way. So this is going to be just a standard FTIR run where we're running one wave number. We're going to run nitrogen through the gas cell, get our background, and then we're going to run the sample. All right, so all the data uh, is, um, this is actual field data. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, what, <laughs> what happened was we processed this data originally and we were seeing, I don't know, 50 to 100 ppb detection limits, which are still well below what you can do without this. But as you'll see, we found what we were doing wrong and I'm gonna show it to you now. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem here, I'm showing what benzene looks like. So this is a benzene curve that's at about 450 ppm. This is 10% water in the blue, and that's about what you might see from a turbine, approximately. And I know you can't see the, uh, the, the uh, Y scale here, but this is 0.25 absorbance units here, all right? And if we're trying to get down to 10 ppb, we're trying to measure this about 50,000 times smaller. Okay, so this peak is not going to be 0.25. This peak is going to be point to five zeros and then five. Okay, and look at all this water that we got to deal with. All right, these peaks are huge. So traditionally, the way one would do this is you would set a line, and of course, in our software, it does this automatically. You set a threshold. And you tell it any peak above that, not, not the red, but any peak of methane or water or methane that's above that, throw it out. Just don't use it. So wherever you see these tan lines, the software is saying don't measure here. I've got plenty of points that I can measure to generate that curve, but I don't want to measure where these peaks are like the size of the trees when I'm trying to measure basically the moss on the ground. All right. So I need I need to do something initially. So in our case, I just set the threshold, say, OK, boom, and it calculates all those lines and throws them out of the analysis. So what happens if I just use that? So here's benzene. I'll have to explain these plots because I realize the numbers are hard to see. Here is zero, and this is real live data. And wherever you see it jump back to zero, it's going through the oxidizer, OK? So don't worry about that. All we want to do is look at this. So this is minus 150, this is minus 200. So if you look at the average, it's about minus 180. Okay, this is again, doing it as a standard method. We're not, we, yeah, we ran it through the oxidizer, but we're not using that data. We're just saying, okay, take this water calibration, use it and try and measure the benzene. And if you look at the residual over here, and again, I realize you can't see the screen, but it's plus or minus uh, about five milliabsorbents, about what I said it would be. Remember, if I have a point that's 0.1 absorbance, the residual is going to be at least 1% of that. As you can see, or mostly all the way across here, that's about what it is. That's about the best you can do. Yeah, maybe you could do a little bit better if you're really careful with your water calibration, but that's not uncommon. So obviously, if I'm trying to measure 10 ppb, benzene and I've got a minus 180 ppb bias, that ain't going to work. We certainly didn't expect to see any benzene, but if it had zero, it is 180 ppb bias. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out that water calibration and I put a water calibration in that was collected here when it went through the tom and here. So I'm just going to put those two spectra in my regression and watch this screen over here. It'll drop, it'll be below it. Those two screens are exactly the same scale. Okay. This is basically a perfect residual. And that's showing the noise that we actually have. This is a hundred times smaller than that. 
And it's just because I took the specter within half an hour or an hour of the measurement. That's how similar the FTIR can generate it if it's collected in the near term. If I try and take a library spectrum, that's the best I can do day in and day out. And if you notice, we now have the data right around zero. Yeah, we've got about a minus five PTD bias. And this data is fairly high frequency collection. And by average, it, you can see it's about minus five PPB, which isn't bad when you consider if any of you ever tried to measure benzene in this region, I bet the best you could do is five PPM, not at five PPB. Okay, so it's a thousand times lower. Makes a change over time. What do you mean? Excellent question. Excellent, excellent. Right. Temperature, the gas temperature can be slightly different. Remember, we have gas in a very big cell, all right? It's flowing in from, you know, we're running at 191C. Maybe the gas is flowing and it's 188, right? That's a big difference. That's just one. The pressure could be slightly different. So you get a little bit of pressure broadening. Any of those things could, could cause it. The system going to a library spectrum, that spectrum in the current instrument could have a slightly different resolution, or they could be slightly changed in frequency. I mean, I, I'm exaggerating it. They're never going to be that bad. But what I'm saying is that it just has to move slightly. And actually, you can kind of see it. You see this kind of derivative type shape? That's telling me there's a slight frequency shift. All right, so any of those things could happen. Temperature, pressure, frequency, resolution. All right, any of those things can cause that. So by doing this over a course of an hour, as you can see, it's it's pretty much holding. Hold out. Yep. Yep. We, we took out, well, we took out the water and the methane in this case. Yeah, CO2 doesn't absorb in this range, so it doesn't matter. And what, what was interesting was the methane and the water were trying to overcompensate. And the way we found it, you're gonna love this. You know, I just, I'm spouting out why this works and I didn't even notice it. But uh, we were looking at the original data. This noise was like that in the residual while we were doing it. And so I'm telling you, this happened a week ago. I sat down with Olivia and we were, and we were saying, well, wait a minute. We were looking at the spectral noise, which I'm not showing here. And we looked at the spectral noise and we saw that it was this low. So we knew we had low noise, but the, the residual noise was 100 times greater. And I was like, well, wait a minute, that's not possible. Well, our software has this interesting feature called debug mode. And in debug mode, you can actually see the regression coefficients for each of the compounds. It tells you how much it's multiplied. <laughs> when we looked at it, it's like, shit, excuse me. The uh, compounds in the library were dominating the analysis. They were huge numbers and they're like well, wait a minute we don't want that we want the, we want this peak or this peak here and this peak here to dominate the analysis and it wasn't happening so we said okay well let's just stop we threw that out we said just use the software the way we meant it to be used and as soon as we did it, it literally went like that and i mean we'd spent weeks on this data before and, we, and it just didn't even occur to us that we weren't looking at the residual and i i can't tell you how many people i harp on when you want to do good infrared analysis, you want to look at the residual. It's telling you everything. But it, because it was nice and symmetric, we thought we had the best we could do. It was just noise. But it was all interference noise. It was all water interference. And we weren't dealing with it properly. So let's just look at a couple of other compounds because we're not just doing benzene. Oh, uh, just one other thing. We need to show that we're not getting any benzene through the system. So what we did was we spiked in about two ppm of benzene into the system, and then we ran it through the oxidizer to show that it all went away. Because we have to demonstrate that we don't have any going through, because if it does, that's going to artificially lower the benzene, because the benzene will be in your calibration spectrum. We have to prove that that's not the case. So if you're going to use this methodology, it'll be you know how you have to do a spike recovery when you're doing an analysis. You should also spike the, the gas into the TOM and show that it goes to zero, just so you know that you don't have 
And of course, we way over spiked this. We wanted to put a whole bunch in. I mean, it's never going to be anywhere near that high. And we showed that it all went away. Okay, so let's look at ethyl benzene. It's worse. It's down around 200, and look how it's drifting, right? I mean, that's in real time. And just because we're not using it, the instrument the way we designed it, that's the kind of stuff you can see in real time. And if you look at the residual here, the, the scale is a little bit smaller, but that's a terrible residual. And then if we, I, I change the scale to one tenth the size. So this is still about 100 times smaller than that. Um, but as you can see, this thing literally went to, on average, 10 ppb. It went again from a minus 250 ppb and it's equivalent all the way across there. Uh, Paraxiline, which was terrible, 1000 ppb. And look how straight that line is. You might say that that's there. Right? There's your, there it is. It's not very noisy. Hey, maybe that is there. Again, terrible residual. And this one went perfectly to zero. If you average all of the up down, it basically gives you zero. All right. And again, this scale is 100 times smaller than that. Now, formaldehyde. I'm going to show the whole analysis on formaldehyde. So here's our spectra up here. And again, we're not using auto ref here. So this one is actually kind of interesting. And this is meant to be a cautionary tale for anybody who's doing formaldehyde testing. So here's what the here's what the sample spectrum looks like. The red is the formaldehyde calibration spectrum, but it's so small it looks like a straight line, right? And if you notice, it starts at about minus 40 ppb and goes down to minus 65. And this is sort of what we were noticing. If you look at this residual here, it looks okay. It's symmetric. There's no features in it. It looks like noise. And so if you looked at that, you say, okay, that's about the best I can do, right? But if you look down here, where we had what's called the single reconstruction, we overlay the formaldehyde, and you can see it's actually pointing down, it's negative, right? You can see that the amount that it's predicting right here at this point, is about what, minus 54 ppb, you can see that it's within the noise. And if you were trying to validate that, obviously you can't have a negative 54 ppb. But if you tried to validate that, you can't see that. There's not, I mean, you can't see it. So again, all we're going to do now is instead of doing auto ref, and a lot of this is due to baseline drift and other stuff, all we're going to do is take the water calibration out, the methane calibration out, and and just kind of watch that bottom screen there. Again, same scale. Two things you notice. Obviously, the noise is much lower here, and since you can't really see it, I just said it's 40 times smaller. But now you can actually see the formaldehyde peaks. I didn't want to blow it up because I wanted you to see on the same scale, but you can actually see the formaldehyde peaks now. So at 20 ppb, we can actually validate that it's actually there. We can say, yeah, that is definitely formaldehyde. If I blow it up, blew it up, you can see. Clearly see that it's there. Okay, any questions on that? So what this is showing again is that we have the noise in the single digit microabsorbance units. We have the signal to noise to do the measurement. Now we just have to make sure that we have a good spectra so that we can actually analyze the data and, and get it out. So this next one is my favorite because we didn't think we could do this one. Anybody who's ever tried to do a seed aldehyde low has always failed. And the reason is, this is what a seed aldehyde looks like. It's just a broad absorber. Wherever it's dropping down, you can pick the fence, okay? So it's just a broad absorber. It has absolutely no really interesting features. It's hard to measure. And so, again, you know, we got a residual here. In a normal situation, if, you, if this were a multi-gas, that would actually be an excellent residual. But it's saying here, we've got a thousand ppb. Okay. So, you know, again, maybe it's there, you know, it could be, but you certainly wouldn't stake your career on it. Now watch what happens if I just put this spectrum in and that one, same data. This goes right to zero all the way across. 
it's plus 20 minus 20. Again, the C-dial is not a strong absorber. But look at this. I mean, we can almost validate that it is not there because there are no features there related to this downline. Noise is 100 times less. And again, we're getting a nice zero based result. So we took it from 1,000 PPB down a thousand fold, and we're now right at zero. We did we weren't expecting a seed aldehyde, but we've always struggled with this one. And yet we were able to get it out. Any questions? So I'll just finish with a summary and take any questions. So a max IR with a long pass filter allows us to do full combustion analysis. I didn't show the CO and other stuff, but we can do those too. We now have the signal to noise to get to the single digit PPB. And, and those points were 15 seconds. If we average to a minute, the noise would be much less. Um, or if we averaged even longer. Uh, so if we do not handle the spectral interference, which in this case is mostly water, uh, we can get serious biases. And as you saw, any of them were from 100 to 1,000 PPB which in the grand scheme of things isn't that much, but for this particular analysis, that's basically the difference between whether it works or not works. So the TOM oxidizes the sample so that we can have a better match. We were able to reduce all the biases to about less than 10 ppb. Um, we reduced the re residual noise by 10 to 100 fold, and we were able to actually see the formaldehyde within the single reconstruction and we were able to say that, hey, there is no seed aldehyde. And this last thing is, I realized after I wrote it, it wasn't quite technically. Legal. So basically, um, <clears throat> we don't need the calibration spectra to be perfect because we're going to generate a perfect calibration spectrum in the field. And one last thing, uh, we have talked to the EPA about this. They are fine with this being compliant to with both method 320 and ASTM because we are generating a calibration spectra. As long as we demonstrate that the calibration spectra does not have the analyte, meaning you have to spike it, that this is a valid method for collecting calibration spectra in the field. And I'll stop there and answer any questions. Do you have to do that? Special for quantum? No, that was the issue is we put the water in the quant list. Did you have to take it out to do this? Okay. Yes, so let's say I want to quantify water. Uh, this version of the software did not have it, but after we learned this, what we did is we put a new version of the software in so we can leave the water in and just tell it not to use it for this analysis. So we can click on the compounds and say, don't use it for this, don't use it for this, but still tell me the water concentration, still tell me the methane, but that's now in the software. We literally added it after we learned this. That's correct. Yep. Well, again, we we normally for for these type of applications, we set up the whole recipe. Um, if they have this device, the Tom and our sampling system, we can literally automate the entire thing. It'll collect all the calibration data. It'll collect all the system data. It'll collect all the spike recovery data. It'll collect the spike. Recovery data while going through the Tom, it'll do that all automatically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So each file actually, depending on what step it has, actually has a name, and we can then tell it to use it or not use it. Excellent. Uh, again, we're not running these catalysts very hot. We haven't noticed any, um, but again, we're testing it every time. We're running the gas through the material just to show that it is reduced. But again, we're not running that much gas through it. Most of the time it's a bypass, so it's just going through the right in and out. We're only running it every so often. And again, if we needed to, we could always clean it off by running it up a little bit higher and kind of clean it off. And we haven't seen any issues to date. What are the other applications? 
years ago when we had the shared trucks and we had to really be careful of the way but they did sensitive vibrations. What I'm saying is is that the NCAS is not sensitive at all to vibration. I mean literally you could put it on a turbine and it would actually run. This instrument, it can have vibration, but it can't have that level of vibration. I mean, it can be sitting next to a generator, won't be, won't be an issue. It, I wouldn't put it on the generator. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it can sit in your van with the generator running and not have any issues. It's fully shock mounted on the inside. You can't see it, but there's an optical plate right here, and it's shock mounted in all directions, both down and side. So it can go this way, it can go this way, it can go this way. So it's a, a bench or a field machine. Yes, it's designed to be in. But because we're scanning a little bit slower, it will pick up acoustic noise if you're not careful. How does it seem? Uh, it depends on the application. Some people are actually getting multiple detectors, so it's a little bit more, but it's in the $70,000 range. That's with the tunnel? No, that the Tom is extra. Remember what we chose. That that is extra. Um, but you know, if you want to do this type of analysis, what the Tom allows you to do is it really allows you to validate your data. Because even if you don't use that spectra in your result, you can always add it and then our analysis algorithm is so fast. You can put it in, do the measurement, take it out, do the measurement. It literally only takes seconds for the whole data set. And so you can run it both ways. You can put in different spectra if you want. That filter has to be placed in chain. No. No, in fact, none of the systems that we've deployed have ever had the filter replaced. They're, again, they're just their cores about that long and they'll they'll run for a long time. Can you sell all Starboost? Okay, yeah. Starboost uh is only if you get the MCT detector. If you get the MCT detector, you in effect have Starboost. That, yeah, the base unit is the DTTS system, uh, but of course people are interested in doing formaldehyde down at really low levels, and that's where the Starboost technology is really necessary. You could do that. You could do uh, formaldehyde with the DTGS if you had the Tom, but your detection limit's only going to be about 30 ppb. Which may not be low enough for what you really want to do. But uh, EPA implications on having to. Oh, no, they know about all this stuff. We've kept them fully up to date on what we're doing. Um, uh, Auto ref is fine if you want to do that. The Tom is fine. Again, they realize that all we're doing is generating a field calibration. It would be no different than just running moisture through the instrument. The difference is, and you'll find this interesting. I can't tell you how many times I've run a water calibration where there's formaldehyde in the water. And I put it into my system and I actually have now I've added water to formaldehyde to my water cap. By doing it this way with the Tom, I know that I don't have any formaldehyde because it's all being stripped out. And again, you're going to spike it anyway. You're going to run that 100 ppb spike and you'll show that it goes to zero. You just have to do a second spike. But if it's all automated, who cares? It takes a few minutes. Software modification is a modification issue. It's software that kind of correct you. Well, again, all the software is designed to put in any spectra you want. So you can either put calibration spectra in, you can put sample spectra in. All you do is click on the spectrum and it'll add it to the method. You can tell it to, like I was, like you asked, you can tell it not to use water for a specific one or use water for a specific one. So you can do any of that and it's completely on the fly. So what you're saying is that the software that you designed it for, that you used it differently to get the result? Yeah, so again, what we found was that the water calibration spectra was trying to dominate the analysis. And we saw that in what we call the debug mode and in debug mode you see each spectra along with a coefficient and those coefficients were way bigger than they should have been anything bigger than a one in a, in a regression coefficient is a big number 
because it, it's saying, okay, here's my sample spectrum, here's my calibration spectrum, and if they're exactly the same height, the regression coefficient is one. We were getting regression coefficients of five, six, seven. So it was using, it was doing it incorrect. It was over analyzing the data. So we threw those out, saying, you know what? We know that the spectra we collected just prior and after the test are perfect spectra. We took them out, and then the, then those constants went way down to where they should have been. That's how we found the problem. I just I, I couldn't believe I didn't. I mean, it was it's like duh. So, um, and, and it was weird because you know I'm looking at this noise and thinking to myself, why is the noise that high in the residual? But it didn't even occur to me that it was just, it was way over analyzing the data. Is, there, is this on your the website now? Do we have information? About there, there's stuff on the website. We, you know, we also have a brochure for the formaldehyde stuff. But this is all brand new. I mean, this stuff um, uh, is stuff we're just doing. And, and as I said, this whole analysis I just showed you is literally not even a week old. We got, I mean, there's still more we can do, um, but the point is, is that, you know, again, I challenge anybody to get below one PPB, PPM on a standard FTIR in that spectral region just because of the water. I mean, it, it's just not possible. I mean, you, you, you'd you have to just take a few points and just not look at where the water is at all, and maybe you could get lower than that, but it's a hard measurement because the water interference is just so intense. <laughs> 